Hello and welcome. Today I'll be going over vRising server and game settings. Now this video is mostly for people who are either new to the game, don't know what to expect, kind of want to have a better understanding of the settings of the game, or if you're a returning player or veteran player who maybe wants a more in-depth understanding of how the server settings work, if you haven't hosted your own server before or anything like that, this is the guide for you. So let's get right into it. The very first thing we're going to do is we're going to play out a scenario where basically we are a brand new player looking to try out the game for the first time and maybe we just want to play alone. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go over to the play button. We have online play and private game as the options for this purpose. For the purpose of this particular part of the tutorial, I'm going to show you the private game section. Now there's three different types of modes you can use by default. There's the relax mode, which is more chill and laid back, a little less combat focused, more exploration and building. The second one, normal, which is kind of a balanced uh, experience. And then brutal is for all the tryhards out there who are way better at the game than I am. So before we get to any of these, we're going to completely surpass these settings and we're instead going to focus on the advanced game settings. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to name this game. I'm going to name it uh, YouTube tutorial video file. And then we're not going to add a password. Um, it's just me, so there's no reason to. And we're also not connecting this game to the internet. So we're going to hit advanced game settings. Then we're going to start going through these options. Now there's major options at the top here to show uh, the bigger categories of options. So I'm going to go over every single little thing here. I'm going to do my best to explain some of the uh, reasoning behind why people might choose certain settings. And hopefully that'll give you guys a better idea of the kinds of things you can do with this game. So the first option here is land server. Uh, only allow players connecting through your local area network. We're not doing that. We're not playing with anyone else. So we're going to leave this alone. Uh, only solo play. We're going to select this because, well, it's just us. Clan size, we're going to reduce to just one. And uh, just to elaborate a little bit with the whole clan size thing. Now, you're probably wondering what the heck is a clan, right? So for those of you who are maybe new to the game, you're not familiar. It's basically the game's equivalent to like a guild. So basically the way it works is anyone who is in your clan will have complete access to your castles, to your inventory and stuff like that. So if you're playing with a bunch of friends and you all want to work uh, together cooperatively, um, then you can definitely choose the clan size based on how many players you want to be all together. And uh, the default is four. I wouldn't recommend more than eight. Um, it, it, it gets kind of big once you start hitting the eight player mark. And uh, it'll also be harder to determine if something goes wrong, uh, who is responsible for the thing going wrong if there's eight players in the clan. So just something to think about. Um, we're going to move on to the allow global chat option. Now, global chat is exactly what it sounds like. It's basically like a shout chat or like just an overall server chat. And uh, basically anyone who's on the server can read that chat unless they have global chat disabled for themselves in their own personal game settings, um, which is completely separate video that's not even you know, it's not the purpose of this video, so I'm not going to get into that. If you'd like to see a guide on it, let me know in the comments and I'll uh, see what I can do. Next, we're going to go to the server time zone. Now, server time zone doesn't have to be the same exact time zone as your PC when you're setting up a server. In our case, we're just setting up a server for ourselves. So we're going to go with the local system time. Now, if I wasn't setting up a server for just myself and maybe I was setting up a server that other people were going to use. And let's say I wanted the uh, let's say the vast majority of players are on the East Coast of the United States or maybe they're in Europe. I could change my server settings uh, to match their time if I really wanted to. Um, so that's basically one of the reasons why server time zone kind of matters. And another reason would just be for daily resets. It's not uncommon for um, companies that host dedicated servers on your behalf 
uh, to basically have a normal like restart period where after X amount of time at a specific time point of every day your server might restart that's pretty normal um, just to keep servers from getting over congested and stuff like that from like inactive players who are maybe just logged in but they're not moving around and stuff like that uh, so if you have a busier server that's uh, something else to think about but yeah just for the purpose of this tutorial we're not going to worry about server time zone so uh, we're going to go with the local system time. By the way, guys, something I forgot to mention, these arrows on the end, uh, it basically allows you to just reset whatever the setting was. So in our case, we're just going to move that down to one, but I just want to let you guys know that. All right. Uh, player and castle interactions. Permission to loot dead players. It's just going to be us. There's no one else who's going to be on the server but because i'm paranoid i'm gonna put only self in this option um if you allow your clan members to loot your bag basically or as i like to call your body bag um basically what it means is that if you die they can take your items and just move it on your behalf or uh if let's say you're on a pvp server and you want to make the rules so that if you kill another vampire you can steal their stuff off of them that's what this uh, option allows you to do, essentially. World settings, soul shards amount. Now there are different soul shards on the servers. Because we're just going to be playing ourselves, this option is kind of irrelevant as far as whether it's unique or plentiful. Um, that's something that we would worry about more in a setting where uh, you have multiple players. So for example, let's say I'm hosting my uh, server, right? And I have a PVP server. Maybe I want to have a king of the server whenever people have certain soul shards so that people can challenge and fight over them and just actively create um, basically an incentive for people to interact with each other. That's an option. Or uh, if we put it on plentiful and let's say we're on a PVE server, then no matter how many times the boss gets killed, there will always be a soul shard for someone to collect essentially. So you don't have to compete over this particular resource. Um, as far as the importance of a soul shard, basically these are necklaces that you wear that replace your ultimate ability and give you like a special new ultimate uh these are very strong uh powerful necklaces um you can use them into the late game but because it's just us it doesn't matter what we choose for this option so i guess we'll go with unique mordium rift incursion interval now for the mordium rift incursion interval we have different uh types of intervals we have the 30 minute one hour 1 hour 30, 2 hour, 4 hour, 8 hour, 12 hour, and 1 day. Now, if you want to do intervals once a day, stuff like that, I mean, cool, awesome, good for you. But uh, I think maybe an hour or less would be probably ideal for a single player, just so that you always have an option fairly frequently to go and do these incursions. Now, there's two different types of incursions. There's the minor Mordium Rift incursions and the major Mordium Rift incursions. Now, the minor incursions are for a level 57 plus, and the major ones are for a level 80 plus. Now, the main thing to kind of keep in mind about what this is, is it's basically the zone where you go into the mid game and the late game to collect shards in order to use them for uh to to basically either spend them on passive buffs for your clan or to gain weapons for late game and also uh, be able to unlock specific weapons that you're looking for into the late game so uh yeah if you want to increase the interval duration you know or anything like that this is basically where you do that um, I think 20 minutes for an incursion is a little bit short. I actually prefer to keep it around 30 minutes and the interval around uh, 30 minutes as well. So that uh, every time there are incursions, you know, they're always going on. The only thing with settings like this, like if you were to decrease the, um, sorry, increase the durations, is that you might see a situation where both minor and major incursion events are happening at the same time, which is totally fine and can definitely work if you're setting up for a server with other people. Um, 
and it can also work for you yourself as well. So this kind of determines how fast you'll be able to access materials in order to progress into the mid and late game. Um, so yeah, this is this is basically where you worry about that. Then you have items, bloodbound equipment. Uh, now I like to mark this and select it because what this allows me to do is let's say I'm going after Adam the Firstborn, for example. I go after this boss, he, you know, maybe he destroys me and I get wrecked, and now I die, right? What I need to do now is come back to the arena from a respawn point. Now, if I have Bloodbound equipment checked, that means I spawn with my gear. If I don't have it checked, it means that I drop my gear upon death. So this is something that I always tend to keep marked just because I don't really see a real reason or value in letting your Bloodbound equipment drop. Uh, especially because getting back to your body bag in certain areas will be very dangerous without gear. And that might even slow you down in the process and get you killed a second time before you can even get back to the boss. So if I were you, I would keep this checked. I don't really see the value in not checking this, but hey, everyone can play how they want. The options are there for a reason. Teleport bound items. Uh, so some items cannot be teleported normally with this setting. Uh, so I almost, I pretty much, actually, I can't even say almost always. I always uncheck this option because I love to be able to teleport with items on me. Now, if for some reason you don't mind uh, the restricted teleport when carrying certain items, then you can leave that checked. But in my opinion, it takes up a lot of time and unnecessary traveling uh, that you could be using in a better way, like, I don't know, exploring a new area or even just crafting stuff in your castle. So I would, uh, if I were you, I would uncheck this. This is my recommendation. Um, bat bound items. So when you are in bat form with this uh, option checked, this would basically prevent you from flying while holding certain items in your inventory. Now, you're probably wondering, why would I stop myself from doing this? Well, if you're playing by yourself, you probably wouldn't. But if you were playing on a PvP server, you might want to prevent people from being able to just fly to safety with the items that they just acquired because then you'll never have a chance to intercept them before they get to their castle so that is something to think about uh so usually in pvp servers i have seen people just check this but because we're playing by ourselves and uh for most pve server scenarios there's no reason to uh mess with this so i would just leave it unchecked Time settings, day length, day time length. So for day length, we have how many seconds uh, your day is going to last. So maybe an entire day night cycle will take 1080 seconds, for example, or we can choose a shorter or a uh, very long, depending on what you want to do. And then the daytime length is basically how long or what portion of the day is daytime. Now you're probably wondering, why is this matter, right? What, like, why is there a daytime length thing? Well, you see, you're a vampire. <laughs> uh, vampires obviously cannot be floating around in the sun. They can't be out there sparkling like freaking, what's his name? I can't think of right now. It doesn't work like that, okay? You just burn. You burn and it hurts. So... Daytime length can greatly affect how many windows of opportunity you have to fight certain bosses. So one of the mid game bosses, Octavian, right? Uh, he, when you fight him, his arena is open. You usually want to fight him at night so that you don't have the disadvantage of sunlight. Something like that might kind of, you know, matter in this case. So let's say I want to have um, less time of daylight and I want to be exploring more and being able to fight things more, then I think short is fine. Uh, if you put it on Swedish winter, then you only get like maybe one or I think it's like what, three hours of your day where the sunlight is out, which is insane. 
Uh, I wouldn't go that extreme, but you could also you could put it um, you can put it on short. I think short is pretty appropriate, especially for most players, in my opinion. Uh, so we're gonna go on to the next section. Next section, we're gonna go over items inventory stacks multiplier so this value is the amount of items that can be combined into a single stack so if you want to have fat stacks you bring it up all the way up and if you don't well then i guess you can just make it harder on yourself for no reason but we're not insane so we're just gonna make it as high as possible i recommend that just so that you have more inventory uh space to basically hold the same of one item Whereas um, in the beginning of the game, you have very limited inventory. So this could be really helpful if you're trying to go to, let's say the copper mines, for example, and get a bunch of copper. Then by the time you come back, you'll still have plenty of space to be able to do that. Or if you didn't have this option, you'll say you had regular stacks, then you would have to come back a lot sooner because you have no space in your inventory. So this kind of determines a little bit how often you'll be going back to your castle to empty your inventory, essentially. The next portion we have, the next option we have here is the loot multiplier. So this affects things like enemies, barrels, boxes, and chests. Uh, so if you want to have normal loot settings, just leave it alone. If you want scarce loot lower it and if you want plentiful loot make it higher well i like plentiful loot we're doing this single player game so we're gonna boost that all the way up to three servant hunt multiplier so early in the game you get the ability to charm humans so that you can then kidnap them and make them your servants you can convert them in a servant coffin and they will basically do as you say basically you can send them out on missions in order to collect specific types of items from certain areas so that takes a long time and if you want the servants to bring back a lot of goodies every time you send them out you just make it higher and if you want them to not be as powerful then you lower it it's really up to you uh for our case we're just gonna boost it all the way up because i feel like it Material yield multiplier multiplies the resource yield for harvesting materials such as trees, minerals, and plants. Now, for the trees, minerals, and plants part, these are basically, um, you know, raw materials, raw resources. Um, if you want to get more out of the rocks you have, you can increase it, and if not, you can decrease it. Something I think that's worth mentioning here would be that if you are on a PVE server, the material yield multiplier should probably be a little higher uh, just because you have to share resources with everyone else. So like uh, one common complaint I hear from uh, PVP players and why they prefer PVP over PVE is that they don't like that they have no way of obtaining a material if the material's already been gathered. This option here, if you increase the yield multiplier, will make it so that players don't have to be harvesting as much, thus allowing more opportunities for other players to go and harvest those same materials. So I recommend raising this all the way up if you have you know, a PVE server, so that's something to consider. Blood Essence Multiplier. Blood Essence is basically something that you get whenever you defeat living enemies. Now, when I say living enemies, I literally mean living enemies. So anything that is like skeletal, undead, uh, anything like that is not going to drop Blood Essence. Whereas anything living like harpies or humans or uh, animals and things like that out in the forest they're going to draw blood essence upon death. If you want to make blood essence more plentiful, then that allows you to basically keep your castle uh, fueled. Because remember, blood essence is something that is also used to fuel your castle heart. Um, you can also convert blood essence into greater blood essence and primal blood essence. Those two different types of essence are eventually used to basically create upgraded weapons and gear and things like that later on into the game. So if you want to make that a little bit easier on yourself, blood essence multiplier is definitely the way to go. Um, so yeah, we're just going to boost that up. Equipment, durability loss multiplier. So... 
there is durability loss in the game. If you want the default durability, you leave it at one. I like to move it all the way down to zero because I really do not like repairing my gear, especially if I'm trying to focus on getting the next tier of gear or trying to progress in gear. I don't like to have to repair gear that I'm trying to get rid of anyway. So I like to bring it down to zero. But if you want to increase the durability loss, make things a little bit harder on yourself, feel free to do that. Uh, that's not me, but you do you. Health multiplier. So the maximum amount of health. Now, this is kind of something that is applied to gear because your gear level or your gear score is basically your vampire level. Uh, there's no experience system in this game where you like gain xp from killing things or whatever um instead your equipment basically determines your gear score so with the health multiplier what this will do is just give you a bigger health pool upon equipping gear um i like to leave it alone i think that keeping it in the default settings is perfectly fine uh next we have resource yield multiplier Okay, so the resource yield multiplier is basically something that is an attribute to your gear. So in this context, whatever gear gives you specific types of resource enhancements. So like, for example, uh, sorry, resource gathering enhancements. So like, for example, like a mace, right? A mace is good for collecting minerals. So uh, maybe that mace will have a yield multiplier in the late game of, I don't know, 5% or something like that. Just as an example. If you, if you want that to be a little bit higher, if you want the resource yield multipliers to get higher and higher, depending on the kind of gear you're wearing, this is where you increase those numbers. Um, this is not the same as the, uh, where is it? as the material yield multiplier because the material yield multiplier just multiplies the material itself whereas the resource yield multiplier basically increases or multiplies the yield of that multiplier so when i say multiplier i'm really talking about traits to your gear um, and values to your gear so uh there's that Physical power multiplier. Physical power is basically just as it says, physical power. Um, remember, this is equipment based. So if you want to be super powerful and strong, you want to say that you uh, you didn't skip leg day and all that, you can just boost it all the way up to three. I think that's a little bit too strong. Uh, I think that having it at normal or maybe a little bit higher in physical power, if you want to be a little bit stronger, uh, somewhere between 1 and maybe 1.5, I think, is good for beginner players just to get a feel and get your feet wet. And you can always adjust this later. Spell power multiplier is basically the opposite in a sense that instead of physical power, we're talking about magic. So if you want to have really strong spells or anything like that and say, well, I went to magic school and I'm a super superior user of this magic. There you go. You can just boost it all the way up if you want, but we're not going to do that for now. We're just going to leave it at the default. Traders. Now for traders, there's different NPCs in the game that sell items. Um, they sell either gear, books, um, seeds, fish, Lots of, I mean, there's a lot of options as far as like things that you can buy from vendors in the game, but th those are just a few of the ones that I would mention. Now you can choose how many items or how many items in stock of a certain item they have when you go to buy from them. So like if you increase their stock, then, you know, let's say you bring it up to times three, then they'll have three times the normal amount of, uh, a specific item in stock for example we're gonna leave this down the one for now but if you ever want to change that you can uh cost multiplier just basically determines how expensive everything is so if you want to inflate the price of everything you just boost it all the way up and if you want to make it really cheap you can just reduce it all the way down we're gonna leave it on the default restock time multiplier so when it comes to restock time the Shopkeepers have a timer where they basically rotate their goods between two sets. 
um, the first, set, like I'll use an example. So in Bright Haven, there's one vendor that sells both ghost shrooms and sacred grape seeds, but they don't sell them at the exact same time. So let's say I show up and I want to get sacred grape seeds, but they're only selling ghost shroom seeds. You can actually see the time that's left for the shopkeeper before they rotate the items, essentially. They rotate their stock. So maybe you'll see, oh, this five minute wait until I can come back here and find the item I want from them. Okay, I'm going to go kill a bunch of humans and I'll be back in five minutes and then I'll buy my stuff. That's basically what that's for. Um, if you want to make the time, you know, uh, longer, you can increase it and make it shorter. You can decrease it. I think default is pretty fair. So we're going to leave that alone. Next, we're going to go to the PVP option. Now, PVP is enabled by default, but we're going to be playing by ourselves. So we're actually going to disable this. But for the purpose of this video, I'm still going to go over these. So player versus player, uh, you can determine whether it's time restricted. So let's say you only want people to be able to beat the crap out of each other during certain times of the day. This is where you set that up. You can set on for your weekends for the times that's Monday through Friday and the weekends from Saturday through Sunday. Now, keep in mind that these time settings are going to follow based on the server time settings, which is why when when we got to the very beginning of this video, when I mentioned uh, where your sol your server time might matter, here's another example of that so if you're running a pvp server make sure that you know what time uh your server is going to be in like your time zone so that you're able to then coordinate and figure out with your friends okay let's have a a uh, certain time frame during the weekend where we just get to beat the crap out of each other for two hours that's totally fine um but if there's no time restriction then it's fair game and you can just beat the crap out of each other just for fun next we have castle rating now castle rating is basically when you rate a castle uh let's say your neighbor said that your castle is ugly and you got upset and you decide to retaliate then you can scuttle all over to their uh castle and if you have the always option uh selected then they're always in danger of you trying to raid their castle. Now, the other option is time restricted. So you can say, okay, you can only raid castles during this time frame on the weekends and from the weekdays. That's totally fine. Then you have, uh, for castle raiding, there's also the option of never. I prefer never. Most, in any PvE situation, obviously you're gonna choose, uh, never. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna ignore this for now just because we're not doing a PvP game, but I just thought it was worth mentioning that this was here. Uh, new player PvP protection. Basically, it's a period of time where you cannot be damaged and you cannot deal damage to other vampires on the server. Um, or uh, other players, I should specify. Other players on the server. So if you want the uh I just got here, don't hurt me buff. And uh, that's basically what that protection provides. And you could you can just change how long that takes. Um, I don't play on PVP, so I can't really recommend how long that would be ideally. And it also depends on whether or not the server is on a fresh wipe, because if your server has not recently wiped, then this might be less important uh, depending. Well, actually, this might be more important if it hasn't. But if it has, maybe it's a little bit less important. So it's really up to you and how you want to set this up. Yeah, PvP respawn time modifier. So let's say you die in a PvP scenario, but you want to make it so that people can't respawn super quickly. You can just increase that time. You know, death timers can just be increased. Uh, allow players to loot enemy storage. That is another option. So if you now here, here's something I want to uh, mention. You could have this option enabled even on a PvE server. Like you would have to choose the PvP option and it says PvP enabled. Now this option allow players to loot enemy storage. This is great for um, PvP players who are maybe looking to have um, an opportunity to kind of sneak in and, uh, you know, maybe loot some storage from your enemies or anything like that. Uh, this actually, this option, uh, I've seen it used also on 
hybrid servers where maybe there is mostly a PvE element to the game, but players can loot enemy chests if they leave their doors open, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's why you would leave this unlocked. Uh, you can choose whether or not you want to do that. Um, but yeah, that, that's what that is for. And durability loss upon death in PvP. Uh, you can decrease it all the way down to zero, or you can make it more and more punishing as time goes on. So let's say we brought it all the way up to 100. I tell someone, hey, I'm going to fight you. And then I lose the fight. I die. Now all my gear is completely destroyed, essentially. It's in my inventory, but it provides no value because it is completely busted. Uh, so that's basically what this would do. Um, we're going to disable this for now, but I just thought it was important to bring up. And like I said before, you can have PVP disabled, but you can still allow players to loot enemy storage. If you want to have a PV, uh, a PVE server where, you know, enemy castles can still kind of get infiltrated and, um, it adds a little element of just an interesting dynamic in general because you'll have players who will just go and explore and they'll find a castle that looks abandoned or maybe they'll like wait for a servant to open up a castle door and then they'll run in and just steal all your stuff but then now they're trapped and they have to wait for someone to open the door before they can escape so these are things to uh consider but yeah, you get to you get to do a lot of fun, interesting things here. I, I'm going to disable this because we're playing by ourselves anyway, so it doesn't matter. Building. So for the building part, we're going to do the decay rate multiplier uh, for castles. So castles are basically run off of blood essence. And when your castle heart runs out of blood essence, uh, it's basically run out of fuel at that point and it starts to decay your castle. Now, as your castle decays, it loses durability and it slowly deteriorates into dust until someone comes along and ine inevitably either takes over the castle or destroys it or whatever. So yeah, that's what this basically does. It basically determines how quickly your castle decays once it runs out of blood. Now, this other option, blood essence drain rate, affects how quickly your castle burns through the fuel of blood essence. Let's say I am running a server where I have a lot of people who want to join and there's not a lot of castle blots. What I might do is I might increase the decay rate multiplier so that any servers that are without blood just immediately start to decay very, very quickly. What this does is it allows players to kind of get in there faster and be able to either take over or completely eliminate that castle. Um, and just kind of free of space naturally. It's like, it's, it's kind of like recycling on the server, really. Blood essence drain rate though, this is the time before you start to decay. So remember, as long as your castle has blood essence within the castle heart that is still available and fueling the castle heart, then it can be drained. So basically, uh, the blood essence drain rate, if I were to increase that, That'll basically determine how quickly I can get into the decay mode. Yeah, that's something you might want to think about when you're setting up servers, but you know, we're just playing by ourselves, so we're going to leave this alone. Castle heart limitation. The number of castle hearts you have determines how many castles you can actually place. So let's say I want to give everyone the option to place five castles, then we increase that to five. In our case, the default is two, but we're going to be playing by ourselves. So I'm going to boost it up to three because I like having three castles. Castle relocation enable. This is a new option with V Rising 1.0 where now we can relocate our castle. So let's say you start off in the game, you immediately put together a castle in Farbane and maybe you're done with Farbane. You kind of don't want to be living down there anymore and you want to move your castle maybe closer to the ruins of Mordium. So you decide to move to either the Cursed Forest maybe east side Dunley or near the south side of it where it, you'll see the hollowed mountains. Now you can take your castle and move it somewhere else so that you can then keep all of your items, all your materials and stuff like that and just occupy a brand new territory. So if you want to enable that, leave that on. If you for some reason do not want people relocating, you can disable it. Or if you want it enabled, but you don't want people basically moving around playing musical plots, then you can 
create a castle relocation cooldown and basically increase it or decrease it depending on how often you want to do it. This value here is based in hours. So let's say I relocate a castle. Now with these current settings, I would have to wait three hours before I can move it again. Um, I can boost that all the way up to two days if I wanted to. So with 48 hours. So yeah, this is kind of an interesting uh, thing here. Castle height limit. Now, castle height limit, the default is three. Three is pretty safe bet for, for most people in their builds. Uh, once you go past the three mark, you start playing with fire the further and further you go. Um, so if you wanna have a 10 story castle, I don't even know if that's possible, but if it did happen, you're gonna see some weird bugs. Um, I do not recommend going higher than maybe four floors for like a solo game. And if you're setting up server settings, I would probably keep it at three. I've experimented a little bit with it and I've noticed a little bit of oddness and glitchiness once I start hitting the uh, four and five uh, tier castle mark. So maybe think about that when you're uh, setting the setting. It's just us. So we're just going to put three territory tile limit. So the tiles are basically like floor squares at maximum heart level five the default is 550 if i wanted to i could just increase it all the way to the sky or well i shouldn't say to the sky uh but i could also put them all up to the highest settings of 800 tiles if i really really wanted to um but yeah these tiles aren't just affecting the first floor it's affecting all the floors so uh if you want to be able to place 800 tiles within like three floors, then you switch it up. But yeah, you can do your adjustments here. And basically this ultimately kind of determines how important or how much of a rush uh, you will have to be in in order to build a full big castle. But for most people, I think the default settings are okay. Um, I like to have a much more exaggerated amount for the level five because i think hey you went as far as to get your castle heart to level five i think that your tile limit should reflect that but that's just my opinion servant limit the servant limit is a little bit different in the sense that it determines how many servants you're allowed to have in your castle at certain heart levels um i like to boost it all the way up to 30 servants uh you can have 20 here in the in-game client but i'm going to show you guys how to increase that in the back end later um but yeah you can basically choose whatever you want and adjust accordingly the next option here is vermin nest limitation now the vermin nests are something that you use to basically spawn things like rats mosquitoes spiders and a bunch of other things uh, in your castle in order to farm them for their materials. If you want to have a limitation on how many there can be, there's that. Uh, and if, if you want to decrease the number, you can do that as well. The reason why I think this limitation even exists is because, well, when you're spawning creatures, I can imagine that if you have like 10 castles on a server all next to each other and they all have 10 vermin nests, that's not going to be a good time. Uh, for anyone on the server probably it's going to be very it might actually I, I would assume it would affect performance I'm not like a dev or anything I don't know like the logistics of that but to me it would come off as something that would um, we also have tomb limitations now the tombs are kind of like the vermin nest but the difference is that you're spawning undead creatures so if you want to spawn undead enemies, then, you know, you want to have a limit to that. Or maybe you want to have an entire graveyard, then you'll have, you can boost it all the way up to 20 within the client. We have prison cell limitation. Now, prison cells are something that allows you to put humans that you've captured into and basically milk them for their blood. So let's say you find a really, really high quality uh, scholar and you want to keep them and maybe you want to milk their blood then you put them in a prison cell now as far as how many prisons you have that's really dependent on you and what you set this limit to i think 50 is way too much there's no way you can in my opinion i don't think you can really fit 50 prisoners in a three-story castle um i think that's a, like you would literally have nothing but prisons um so yeah just be careful with this i would maybe leave it at 16 or e even just boost it up to maybe no more than 30 at the maximum 
Lockbox limitation. So your lockbox is basically your vampire lockbox, which is something that you can only build a certain number of times per castle. So let's say I have one castle and I have this option to one, then I have one lockbox I can make. Now, the reason why the lockbox matters is because lockboxes cannot be opened up by other vampires. So let's say you get raided, you lose the raid and people steal your you know, basically steal the goods from your inventory. Rest assured that anything you put in this vampire lockbox will not get looted. So that is the purpose of the lockbox. Stygian summoning circle limitation. Uh, so basically the Stygian summoning circle is basically a nether gate that players may build uh, in a single castle that allows you to summon... Uh, <laughs> it allows you to spawn enemies that you'll maybe that you'll later use for different purposes so i haven't messed around too much with this yet but i can imagine that one should be enough for now and i'm gonna leave it that way <laughs> throne of darkness limitation the throne of darkness is basically just a item that you get when you it's basically a furnishing item that is like a big ass throne. So, you know, Dracula's throne, once you defeat him, you are able to claim that. So, um, once you claim the throne, having a limitation on how many of those you can have in your castle, there's that. They are very big and they are not space efficient. They take a lot of space. So if you want to limit how many of these people can put in their castles, Feel free to do that here. Next, we have the crafting and building options. We have build cost multiplier with building versus crafting. I'm going to explain the difference between building, crafting, refinement, and conversion. Building is when you build your castle. So anything where you build a crafting station, you build a piece of furniture that you put on the wall, or like, let's say, um, you know, you want to build maybe some carpets or something. You would have the raw materials or secondary materials in your inventory. And then you would just place the items fully completed building from your inventory. You don't have to actually take time to build different things. All you have to do is just have the items in your inventory and then just place it. Uh, crafting cost multiplier. So for, for crafting... Crafting is basically anything that has to do with creating any kind of final product. So an example of this would be something like potions, gear, weapons, things like that. If I'm going to create any of these items, I have to craft them using a crafting station. Now, the crafting cost multiplier determines how many materials or how much of a certain material you're going to need in order to create those items so if you want to make it more taxing to use the crafting stations you increase the cost if you want to make it a lot easier you can just make it zero and then you can just build an item without anything in your inventory which is also kind of fun honestly <laughs> um the crafting rate so crafting rate just determines how fast the crafting situation will take now the default, in my opinion, is a little too slow, so I would raise it up to maybe three. I think three is a, a decent speed, especially if you're playing by yourself, because you don't want to be limiting yourself based on your crafting speed. <laughs> a refinement cost multiplier. Now, refinement is different from crafting and building. So refinement is basically when you take primary materials or raw materials and turn them into secondary materials so one example would be something like turning stone into stone bricks so you, you would take stone put it in the grinder and then it would turn into stone bricks that is refinement that is a refinement machine uh one of the telltale signs to tell whether you're interacting with a refinement machine versus a crafting machine is whether or not you have to tell the machine what to do. So a good example to show the difference between refinement and crafting is that a refinement machine 
would be something like a furnace, right? Because if you put items in a furnace, it would automatically start uh, creating that new item depending on what items you submitted. And of course you can choose uh, which items you do and do not want to craft at the time or whatever you want to prioritize based on uh, what you have selected. So there's that. Now, if we're talking about crafting machines, a crafting machine would be something like an anvil, because an anvil, you have to tell the anvil, make me this item. And when you choose the item you want to be made, that then becomes your crafting, uh, your crafted item. So remember, the difference is, the, the difference between a refinement station and a crafting station is whether or not you have to direct what it is that station is creating. So that is something to keep in mind. Refinement cost multiplier works just like the crafting cost multiplier, um, just for a different purpose, in this case, refinement. So are you gonna need more stones to make that stone brick? Then you can increase it, decrease it, or whatever you wanna do. So we're gonna leave that alone. And of course, refinement rate also works in the same way, kind of like crafting rate. How fast does the machines work? Uh, how fast do the machines work? We're just going to choose that. We're going to bring it up to three. I think three is a nice solid uh, balanced uh, decision here where it's not so long that you can't get any done, anything done. You're just waiting around, but it's not so short that it's like you never crafted anything. So I think that's a happy medium. Uh, servant convert rate. Now, conversion. This is something different from crafting, building, and refinement. Basically, as I like to call it, it's when you put humans in the oven. Now, you put them in the coffin. I'll give one example. Let's say I decide to kidnap a poor villager from Dunley, and I decide, okay, this villager, I like you. You're going to be my servant. I can stuff them in the coffin and let them cook or as I like to say, microwave in the coffin, stick them in the microwave, and when they're done, they are out and ready to serve. You can equip gear on them, all types of stuff. The convert rate just determines how long that process actually takes. So if you want to be using a... <laughs> so if you want to be cooking with the strength of a microwave, you can bring it all the way up to six. And if you want to be cooking with the strength of a easy bake oven, well, then we can bring it all the way down to 0 0.5. So uh, <laughs> it's really up to you with what you want to do there. Progression. This last tab is also very important. You have starting equipment, starting resources, and starting level. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each one here just to kind of give you guys an idea. Starting equipment is exactly what it sounds like. You start the game. This is the items you start with. This is the equipment you start with, right? Um, so let's say I want to start with, I don't know, merciless gear, right? Then I have the merciless setting. I have merciless copper equipment is what I start with. That's gear level 40. Or maybe I want to start a little bit higher up. Maybe I want to start level 60. Maybe I've already seen the early game stuff and I wanted to start in the middle of the game. I can do that. Uh, you can increase it, increase it until eventually you're at level 90 gear where you're, where you're basically using the Dracula equipment. Um, you can do that for whatever reason, but uh, yeah, that option is here for you. Then you have starting resources. So starting resources are kind of like a care package. Uh, they're basically the items that you start with in your inventory. So if you start with level 30 supplies, okay, then you can do 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and you can just kind of mess around with whatever you're comfortable with. If it's your first time playing the game, I recommend starting with none, just so you have a basic idea of how the game functions, and then maybe determine in the future, hey, this isn't my first run through, maybe I'll start with level 40 resources or something like that. Uh, same thing with starting equipment. If you're brand new to the game, I recommend starting on the default options of none for both starting equipment and resources. Starting level. This basically determines how far in the game you've made it, right? Now, I really wish there was a description here for this, but this option used to be uh, you would go in and for every single enemy, you would like choose whether or not you've unlocked that enemy or you've defeated that enemy. Uh, with starting level, this kind of determines, okay, um, maybe I want to start at level 50. All of the bosses level 50 and under have been cleared once you enter the game. Basically what starting level does is it unlocks any recipes um, that are behind bosses. So uh, like, let's say I want to get 
X item from X boss, then if they're un if they're level 50 and under, in this case, they would have their stuff unlocked and I would have access to that. That also unlocks things like skill points, points that you can spend on your spells in the early game. So if you want to have all that unlocked or not, there's that. Um, this also affects how many items you have unlocked. So there's a research desk, right, that you start the game with. So if I want to have you know brand new starting level i could bring it all the way down to like zero right and basically that means i have to start from the study desk and learn every single recipe all the way up until uh max level it's kind of misleading in my opinion to to phrase it as a starting level because it's not really a starting level it's more like a starting position it doesn't really determine like your gear it's separate from gear it's separate from resources right but it basically determines what have you unlocked how far have you progressed so far that's what this is so uh i think starting level is a little bit misleading here uh, but if you want to make it so that all the bosses and everything is completely unlocked you can just start on 90 and just go fight dracula if you wanted to so uh yeah for the purpose of this video we're going to uh save new rule set now that we've made that we're going to hit save at the bottom as well and then we're going to go back and then we're gonna hit start new game. So this is the part of the video where things start to get a little bit more complicated because we've already talked about the basic settings from the front end. Okay, so now for the second part of this video, I'm going to be showing you how to do some of the back end stuff or the more advanced server settings. So let's get started. I'm gonna go over to load game and we're going to choose YouTube save file because that's the uh, example file that we made earlier. I'm going to go to directory and it will open up this window, which will show you the exact location of the game files. So you have different options here. Usually you want to leave start date and session ID alone. For the most part, as far as I know, there's no real reason to do anything to these files. So we're going to leave that alone for now. Then we're going to go to server host settings. So we're going to start with this. I'm going to open this up in uh, my program here. In order to edit any of these files, all you need is some kind of coding uh, program. So in my case, I use Atom. I know it's discontinued and sunsetting and all that. I really don't care. I only use it for this game. So here I am. Notice it shows name YouTube save file and it shows max connected users one. Now, if I was working on a server where I wanted to invite my friends and let's say I changed my mind, I want to have 50 people on the server maximum. I could change this number to 50 and it would then be the max connected users. Uh, another option could be to change the name of the server. So let's say I want to name it Twitch save file. So just for example's sake, I'm going to do it now. So let's say I decide, forget YouTube, we're going to Twitch and it's a Twitch save file. Now I'm going to save this file and then I'm going to go to the game. And if I hit refresh, it'll switch to Twitch save file. So you can tell immediately that that's exactly, you know, the file we're working on. So if you're ever unsure, you could always do something like that just to see what happens. This is only a local save file that we're working on, but this uh, method of changing the server name and stuff like that, it's something you see just in general while working on the uh, advanced settings. Let's close this out, right? And we're going to go to directory again, but this time we're going to go to server game settings.json. We're going to open this JSON file and it's going to show us a ton of settings that may or may not have been visible or available in the initial setup in game. So remember when we went back and we decided to edit settings, right? When you edit settings within the client, it only gives you 
very limited options compared to the advanced settings, but these settings are usually pretty okay for most players. Now, if you're doing something a little bit crazier like I am, then you might want to use something else. So in this case, we're going to go to the very back and we're going to look at the different options, right? Something I get a lot of questions about all the time when I'm doing my castle decorating, how do you make it so that you don't burn in the sun? Because I disable sun damage, right? So if we look at the sun damage modifier up here, you can see it's 0 0.75. If I make it 0, 0.0, and then we save the file and let's say we close out of it and we refresh. Now, if we open the game, we're going to load into the game and we're going to stand in the sun and see if this change applied. If I walk into the sun and I take no damage, then that means that the changes were applied correctly. But when you go through your game settings, there's a lot of different options and different things you can change. Sun damage modifier is one of those things. Um, you can also change things like your clan size to a much larger number than whatever the client allows. So let's say you wanted to change your vampire stats. So vampire stat modifiers, so you can put, you know, power modifier, or if you wanted to change your magic damage, you can increase your magic damage here. But not every line is going to appear here. So my understanding is that the less lines of code there are, the faster things like this can be read by the game. If there's a setting here you want to change, but it's not visible, all you have to do is write in what the setting is in quotation marks like this, but also within brackets. And you have to make sure that when you add them into the section, that you put a colon and then the value afterwards. And you usually want to follow that with a comma at the end. If you forget to put the comma in, or if you do some kind of silly, like, you know, error or punctuation error in the code, then you, when you refresh the page, you might see something that says corrupted save or corrupted file. Don't panic. Usually, that just means that you made a little oopsie on the back end. Now, usually you go back, you proofread what you did and you notice what the mistake is. And once you fix it, it'll no longer be corrupted. So just keep that in mind. Uh, if you see something that says, you know, game is corrupted, game file corrupted or something like that. Don't panic. Go back into your program. Check out what you did and make sure that you added the correct punctuation. Now I'm saying punctuation because I'm not a programmer. I don't know if there's like actual terms for this. I'm sure someone like way smarter than me can explain it a little bit better. Um, but I'm doing my best and I feel like, you know, this is kind of helpful in general. So yeah, we're just going to make our vampire. I'm going to name them Sholo. And we're going to hit complete. Something else I get a lot as a question is whether or not you can change your name after you uh, created your character on a server. And as far as I know, as of the timing of this video, the answer is no. Um, I don't know if there's any mods out there right now currently that allow you to do something like that. But at the same time, uh, as far as like what the game allows for and a lets you do as of right now no that is not currently the case so i'm very sorry to those of you who unfortunately have names that you're kind of stuck with for now maybe the devs will add something in the future that'll allow us to change that but for now that is not the case so i'm gonna stand in the sun and i took no damage it looks like i i completely forgot but recently they actually changed uh the layout of the clouds but as you can see, I'm standing right in the sun and I'm taking zero damage whatsoever. So I can just keep standing in the sun and take no damage. Just know that if you decide to change your starting gear after you already left your coffin, it's not going to apply. It only applies to anyone who newly joins a server. Um, so if you stayed in your coffin, didn't go out to explore this feature, make sure that the settings are right, then you would still have a chance to go back and change your starting items. Now, as far as starting items go, I usually just kind of use the in-game uh, settings to do that. So uh, we're not gonna do that now because obviously it wouldn't work since we already left our coffin. Uh, but yeah, just know that if you want to check specific settings, 
make sure that you have your starting gear figured out before you leave your coffin. Otherwise, you will not get that gear when you leave the coffin and you'll have to create a brand new save file. That being said, the good news is that if we leave the game, so we're going to, sorry, we're going to go to the main uh, screen. We're going to hit load game and we're going to go to a uh, Twitch save file, right? Now, if I go to the edit settings tab and I hit save new rule set, I can make a copy of that file and just name it uh, YT tutorial settings. So YouTube tutorial settings. So, and I can write a description and then I'm gonna hit save. So now I'm going to select, actually, I'm gonna go back, right? Now remember the, the sun modifier change was something we did on the back end, right? But I wanna show how, uh, as long as you save your settings, it still applies even if you did work on the back end, it just saves the exact same file settings. So we're gonna hit play, we're gonna hit private game, and we're going to name this uh, take two, cause this is our second uh, chance. So we're going to hit advanced game settings, we're going to select rule set, we're gonna scroll all the way down, to where it says YouTube tutorial settings and we're going to load. Then we're going to save. Remember to hit save because if you don't hit save, it's not going to apply to the game you're setting up and then hit back and start new game. So when you start new game, in theory, I should also not take sun damage in this instance. All right, so this is the part of the video where I want to give you guys some useful resources to help you with this whole process. The first thing I want to go over is the uh, article on Tech Raptor, which was updated May 7th of this year, the day before the release by Robert N. Adams. So thank you, Robert, for posting this. This is actually a settings guide that shows you most of the settings you'd probably want to change. Um, it tells you what options you can type for the different settings options. So like if we uh, so I'll use the sun damage modifier option, like as an example. So if I go to sun damage modifier and then, you know, of course the default is 1.0. If you turn that to 0.0, .0 we already know it removes the sun debuff. So that's just one example of the things on here. Silver strength modifier, holy area strength modifier, uh, garlic area strength modifier, things like that. They're all listed here. And these are all the names of each value that you would have to type in in order to apply that into the game settings file. So yeah, this is super helpful and super useful. This is the most comprehensive guide I've found so far. So what I'll do is I'll link this one in the description below. A second resource I wanted to show here is the GitHub where Stunlock Studios, the devs for vRising, have put out dedicated server instructions. And on this page, you can go, if you click on current, that brings you up to uh, the current version of the game, assuming that is what you're doing. And if you're doing anything legacy, those two other links are there for you as well. And this basically shows you the setup on how to run your own dedicated server for the game. If you're currently in the market looking for a provider for your dedicated server or someone to rent from for your dedicated server, I have a promo code that I'm going to put in the description below for four net players. I currently use them for my uh, V rising server. So uh, if you use that code, that gives me a little bit of help as far as when it comes to running my own server. So uh, yeah, uh, if, I'm just going to leave that below and I hope that you find that helpful. One last thing I would like to add is that I also have put together a game settings file for if you guys would like to play on a creative mode or sandbox mode of the game. Um, those are the settings I currently use when I put together my castle building or do my castle building content. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, I'm going to leave that link in the description below as well. And it brings you to an instructions file and a server game settings.json file. Now, all you have to do is download this file and then read the instructions. And when you read the instructions, you just follow it very carefully. Uh, I try to make it as clear and concise as possible. And basically what this is for is to have uh, kind of like a 
sandbox mode game settings because this is something I get a lot of questions about when I make my um my castle builds they'll, they'll ask like how did you you know disable the sun how did you like what settings do you use well in order to answer that question I just created the link so you guys can go download that now and make sure you follow and read the instructions before you even do anything regarding this file um so yeah make sure make sure you follow it to a T that being said um, I'm going to give an example and show you how to do it now. So let's say I want to do some castle decorating, but I want to have the game files that I have there. So what I'm going to do, we're going to hit play. We're going to go to private game and we're going to name this uh, Sholo's Castle Decorating Settings. All right. So we're going to hit start new game we're not going to hit any options right we're going to exit so cancel vampire customization and leave the game yes so we're going to choose that option and now when we go to the load game section we're going to hit shallow's castle decorating settings and then we're going to go to directory when we hit go to directory it's going to open up this page now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this server game settings.json file and I'm going to click and drag it into this folder and I'm going to replace the file in the destination. So now that that's done, I'm going to close this out. We're going to hit refresh. And when I go to open or host the game, it's going to have all the new settings for castle decorating and building that we added. Now, remember, when I first set this up, I didn't change any settings. I just went straight to default. So if I'm going to be doing some sandbox mode slash castle decorating kind of stuff, uh, this is how we're going to apply it. So I'm just showing you just as an example. Uh, make sure that if you're going to download anything from the Internet, guys, I know this is like kind of without saying, but don't just download random files from the internet, you know, as I tell you to download this random file from the internet. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, we're just going to wait for this to load. All right, cool. So we're back into this screen. Uh, we'll just choose like a random, you know, actually we're going to, we're going to do randomize. Perfect. And we're going to hit complete and we're going to name ourselves Sholo and we're going to hit complete. So now we're going to go into the game and when I hop out of this coffin, it should immediately apply a bunch of unlocks and both spells and also a bunch of stuff in my inventory. So just watch. So notice you have all of the unlocks happening. New V blood defeated, K, uh, press K to view reward. And if I look, I have you know, all these spell points that I can spend, right? So we know that the settings that I have set up have applied to this game file. So actually, just to make things a little bit easier, I'm just going to unlock this, <laughs> get a little bit more distance, you know. We're going to head over to the to a random plot just so I can show kind of like an example of what this game file does. I figured, you know, showing you guys in context what the actual uh, settings changes are might actually be very helpful. So that's the main reason why. Notice I stand in the sun. I don't take damage. The sun doesn't even react to me. Uh, I can also already transform despite killing nothing. So these are the kinds of settings and the kinds of flexibility you get when you're... Um, when you're going into the back end and changing settings manually, you can do so much more by using that method. Cool. I made it onto the to the area and I'm going to place my castle heart. I have my setting up to five. If I talk to the castle heart or talk to myself, it might seem kind of odd, but that's OK. We can upgrade the castle heart four times and uh, now, if I start building, you notice nothing costs anything. So if I were to go to um, like foundation, 
if I hover over, it says 200 out of zero stone bricks. It will cost me nothing to place anything in this game mode. So this is like a pure, I would say this is purely a sandbox mode, uh, but you still need blood. I could disable uh, the blood drain modifier. So let's say I wanted to make it so that I never go hungry and I never need blood. I could definitely do that. Uh, I hope that this tutorial has proved useful to you guys. I tried my best to kind of explain things in a way that is probably understandable to most people. I hope. Um, if you're ever unsure or have questions about stuff, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section. I'll do my best to answer the questions. And if I don't know the answer to your question, I'll try to see if I can find someone who does. Um, yeah, but let me know uh, what you guys think of this tutorial. If you'd like to see more in-depth stuff like this in the future, feel free to let me know. I was thinking about maybe also doing a console tutorial. Uh, if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, great. But that's that is another feature in this game is using the console. So uh, that's something I myself don't know a lot about, but I would like to learn more. So maybe that would interest you guys. But yeah, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you for taking the time to watch my video. I hope you found it useful. Make sure to like, share, subscribe. In case you don't know, my name is Shiloh Q. I'm a Shiloh Eats Queenly Reaper and Guide to the Underworld. I stream three times a week on Twitch, Kick, and YouTube, and also on Twitter for this month. Just testing that out. And I usually stream V Rising, but I do stream other games too. I hope you come over and I hope that you come and stop by at some point to say hi and check it out. If you want to check out my stream schedule, you can find that you can find that on pretty much all of my social media, uh, especially in the YouTube community tab. I usually post it on Sundays. So yeah, I hope you have a wonderful day and as always, Sholo out.